So, I'm Scott Henshaw, and I work in University Archives here at UNCG. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, uh, especially our panelists. Um, and I want to just tell you very briefly about the oral history project we're doing for the 125th anniversary of the university. Uh, we're expanding upon the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection, uh, and as part of the 125th celebration, we're trying to get a lot of oral histories done, and we're trying to focus on groups that are underrepresented in the community, uh, that haven't been talked to before. We're obviously trying to still talk to professors and administrators and women's college uh, alums. Uh, we, we're going to talk to them too, but we're trying to get people that we haven't talked to before. So one of those groups is LGBTQ uh, folks. Uh, we're talking to groups like military and veteran students. Um, we're talking to international students. So um, if you fall in any of those groups, some people fall in many of those groups, and you want to talk to, to us if you want to do an oral history with us, uh, you can get in touch with me. I have some cards with me here. Uh, you can also find me um, on the UNCG uh, website. Just Google UNCG Special Collections and University Archives, and you can find us. Uh, but I want to, I guess, turn it over to Stacy next, and uh, she's going to start us off. Hello everyone, on behalf of UNCG Libraries, especially the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives and University Libraries Diversity Committee, I want to thank you all for being here to listen to this panel. My name is Stacey Krim and I also work in Special Collections and University Archives and UNCG Libraries has been collaborating this month for UNCG Pride Month with our colleagues in the Office of Intercultural Engagement, Elliot Kimball and Kate Rawson, who have had a jam-packed month uh, in honor and celebration of our LGBT students here. Um, and I'd like to give them a hand. As Scott mentioned, we are enhancing our oral history projects um, with our LGBT students, faculty, and staff. Uh, we're also looking to increase in other areas of our collection. So this is a public service announcement that if you have any textiles or artifacts relating to the LGBTQ history of this campus, we are very interested in growing our collection. And you can get in contact with me, or you can find us online if you have anything, whether they are wristbands, pins, dresses from drag shows, uh, material from coming out ceremonies, anything you can think of that's directly related to the history, please let us know. Before we begin the panel and I introduce our speakers, I would like to remind you to turn your phones to silent. Okay. Our speakers today, starting on my side to the other end, our first speaker is Dane Hansen, who is from Lincolnton, North Carolina. And Dane started at UNCG in fall of 2014. Dane's major is, com is computer science with a minor in American Sign Language, Mathematics, Information Systems Management. Dane works as a tutor of American Sign Language for the Tutoring and Academic Skills Program and Special Support Services, and also works as a resident advisor for Guilford and Mary Faust Halls. <laughs> Kathy Williams was an undergraduate student at UNCG from 1970 to 1974. Yes. <laughs> During her first two years at UNCG, she was a member of the first class of what is now the Ashby Residential College. She graduated in 1974 with a degree in teaching physical education. Kathy returned to UNCG as a faculty member in what is now the Department of Kinesiology in 1988. She rose through the faculty ranks to full professor. Between 1998 and 2007, Kathy served as department head in several departments, including dance and exercise and sports science, now known as kinesiology, and as director of the graduate program in gerontology. <coughs> Since 2007, she has been an associate dean in what is now the School of Health and Human Sciences. Jim Carmichael came to UNCG as a lecturer in the Department of Library and Information Studies in 1988 and was hired tenure-tracked in 1989, tenured in 1995, and became full professor in 2000. Jim began phased retirement in fall of 2016 and will retire fully in fall of 
in terms of his research and community work, as he puts it, I've meddled in everything. <laughs> his areas of academic interest include library history and gender and race studies. Jay Poole arrived in UNCG as a junior in 1982. He graduated in 1984 with a BA in psychology, returning in 1997 and graduating in 1999 with a master's in social work. Jay returned as an adjunct instructor in 2003. He moved into a visiting assistant professor role in 2004 and began a tenure track position as assistant professor, professor in 2009, becoming associate professor in 2014. His research interests include gender and sexual identity, clinical social work practice, and gerontology and social work practice. Zachary Johnson was an undergraduate student from fall 2012 to spring 2016 and is now a graduate student with plans to graduate in spring of 2018. His undergraduate majors were political science and women and gender studies, and Zachary is currently in the women and gender studies MA program. He has worked on campus at UNCG Spartan Call Center and the women and gender studies program office. So to begin our panel, you may suspect this question, why did you choose to attend or seek employment at UNCG? Well, when I first started thinking about universities, I, so I wanted to go to UNC Charlotte because that was the one that was closest to my house, the one easiest to go home, see my parents, but um, I applied to UNC Charlotte, UNC Asheville, and UNC Greensboro, and UNC Greensboro chose me. UNC Asheville and UNC Charlotte did it. So, um, when I got here, um, I did the tour and I didn't like it. But then, um, when I came back, wait. <laughs> when I came back for SOAR, like, the campus had bloomed. It was winter when I came here and it was cold and there was nobody here. When I came here for the summer, um, for SOAR, I just fell in love with the campus. And um, though I was like, oh, I'll come here for a semester and leave, um, I found my I found my home, and this is where this is where I belong here. My experience was a little different. <laughs> it was the '70s. It was the end of the Vietnam War. My parents wanted me to go someplace where I would be safe. I'd applied to a half a dozen liberal arts schools in the Northeast, and they said, mm, "Not so much." Go to that little girls' school down there in the south where your PE teachers had graduated. Uh, but uh, but again, I mean, it, uh, it wasn't that safe girls' school. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't know if the civil rights background of UNCG when I first came here. Uh, it, there was a, a gay community, although I didn't quite know what that meant at the time yet. Um, but, yeah, it was home. And... To answer the second part of that question about seeking employment, it was still home. You know, I had gone off, gone to graduate school, gone to a couple of other um, institutions to work, and had the opportunity to come back and thought, that would be awesome. And that was almost 30 years ago. Almost 30 years ago. 29? 29, yeah. Um, so we, we started the same year. Uh, I think for me, it was uh, I had a job offer from um, LSU in my briefcase. I was a doctoral student at Chapel Hill, and so I followed Marilyn Miller over here from Chapel Hill. She became our department chair in 88 and taught part-time here and part-time in Chapel Hill, drove eight hours a week, and uh, back and forth. Uh, for, you know, like a half salary, and then, you know, at the end of that time, with this offer from LSU in my pocket, I got an offer from um, UNCG, and I had just moved my uh, mother's house between, she died in 86, so I moved her belongings between three households in North Carolina, um, Connecticut and Texas, and so after that, I did not want to move anywhere. <laughs> and uh, I had done my moving for a while, and um, also my friends were all here, um, and I just didn't want to lose any more friends. Remember, this was '88, 
and we were dropping like flies. And uh, I just really liked it here. It seemed perfectly fine. But the main reason, the practical reason, was this is where the manuscripts were at Chapel Hill, because I was doing Southern Female Librarians as my research topic. And I wouldn't find many, well, LSU is not really Southern, it's sub Southwestern which is a little bit different, and it's a totally different culture. So I was interested in what UNCG and UNC Chapel Hill had offered. Well, 36 years ago, I um, had just finished at Davidson County Community College, and I went there by accident. I never intended to go to college. That was not in my uh, plan at all. I was going to go to work in the furniture factory where my father worked and be a good southern working class white boy. And turns out uh, that didn't quite happen. I never have taken the SAT to this day, so I have no idea what that's like. Um, <clears throat> it was all by accident. So UNCG was kind of that way for me too. It was by accident. But I knew about UNCG because in high school, which would have been about 1979-ish, I used to come over here with a couple of my friends and park in the parking lot, which is right near the financial aid, it was the financial aid building, the old financial aid building. They've moved now, so. Uh, but where financial aid was for the last several years, that was a gay bar. That was called Davies Gay Bar. And so for us to be able to see real gay people, we would come and park in the parking lot and hunch down in the seats <laughs> and watch people go in and out of the financial aid building, which wasn't that big. Um, so I knew about UNCG, and I also had heard that UNCG is where the girls are girls and the guys are too. And that just fit me to a T. So in 1982, I came over here and moved into my dorm and Philip Hawkins and my roommate who I did not know he was from Maryland his name is Jay too um, we're still very good friends I'm his daughter's godfather or mother whichever way you want to go um, he said he, he met me that first day he called his girlfriend and said Cindy my roommate's a queer so I didn't know that till many years later that he had already read me just like that because I thought I was very much uh, in the closet at the time. But that would change. Uh, I came to UNCG in fall of 2012 uh, and the way that I made my decision to come to UNCG was the only really appropriate way to decide which college to go to and that's my best friend went here and uh, my best high school friend went here and I didn't want to be separated from her. Uh, so. I had just already decided that I wanted to go to UNCG pretty early on. I didn't apply to any other colleges, and when I got in, I didn't feel like paying $75 to pay to uh, apply to a bunch of other colleges. So I just I just settled with UNCG, but I later found out that it was UNC gay, and that sounded pretty good to me. Um, and so I came here and wound up loving it, and have uh, I decided to pursue my master's degree here as well uh, because I love the staff here so much and I didn't feel ready to like go off to a PhD program and be away from my UNCG family so I thought staying local for a little while longer would be best for me. I was out when I arrived on campus. Uh, it was well, I joined the UNCG Pride Club when I got here and wound up meeting a lot of great people through that. So there was a presence on campus and I felt like there was some amount of recognition, but there was also kind of like apprehension as well. I remember uh, when I was at SOAR getting oriented and everything here that uh, our tour guide informed us that if we weren't comfortable with like guys kissing guys and girls kissing girls that we probably should choose another school because it was, quote, in her words, that kind of university, uh, whatever that means. <laughs> so, yeah, so I feel like there was recognition that these th the gay things were happening on campus, but I think there was some ambivalence about the value of that. But um, So, yeah, that was, that was an interesting, and me being out at the time, and I was like, well, I guess she means me, I guess is who she's talking about, or whatever, so, yeah. <laughs> 
let's see, in 1982, um, there was a presence on campus. Um, I know from some of the history that the Pride organization started in about 1978, best we can tell, and we think it might be the oldest one on a college campus, public college campus in the United States. We're not quite sure about that. So there was some presence, but it was very much underground. Um, I was out, so to speak, but that meant that I knew the places to go hang out which were clandestine. One of those places was the basement of this library, actually, at that time. Um, <clears throat> so there was a sense that there was a presence here on campus, but it was very hidden, which was part of the intrigue, by the way, was that hidden lifestyle. Uh, there was something cool about being underground, literally, sometimes. <laughs> What's that? Uh, I mean, I just don't. I guess everybody knew but me, but I, I had, I had articulated being gay by the time I got here in '88, uh, which I guess is part of the awakening, and I continue to articulate all the time. Um, what was it like? Well, our department's kind of strange. When I see. We only had two straight faculty members out of seven, so <laughs> um, library science is a little bit different. And I guess, you know, um, somehow the brain migrates upward as you get older, farther away from adolescence. And it's sort of not as important, uh, maybe. However, we used to have a dining hall where you got served where, um, I can't even place it right now, I guess it's where we have our teas. Um, and it was called the Dogwood Room, which we always call the Dog Food Room. And um, a lovely place. And the first, the first day I went down there was Sangster Parrot and B. Kovacs. Um, I always dressed up, and uh, I guess this guy at the next table didn't like it. He got kind of vocal about it. And B looked over at me and said, Jim, don't even pay any attention. We'll take care of him. And I, with friends like that. <laughs> I should have said when I ran into you today, I think it's the first time I've ever seen you without an ascot. <laughs> ever. Um, when I got here in 1970, I wasn't gay. Um, I think every, like you said, Jim, everyone else knew I was, but I didn't. <laughs> Um, I had dated guys when I was in high school and thought, this is just weird. Why am I doing this? But, you know, I was raised in a, a devoutly Catholic household, and you were supposed to get married and have babies. And I kept thinking, oh, crap. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so, um, you know, I arrived on the UNCG campus, and um, I think my first realization of what gay meant other than happy was, Gaylor, help me here, there were two women in our dorm who I think got caught in bed together and it was scandalous. Do you remember that? Oh. Maybe I just heard. Our first, our freshman year. Were they freshmen? I think so, I don't know, I just remember two women got caught and it was just a huge scandal. But anyway, one thing led to another. I had, I had a straight roommate. I can't hear you. <laughs> we'll, we'll walk down memory lane okay. later. Yeah. Um, I, I had a straight roommate who, uh, I didn't know about the bar, that, that Jay and I had this conversation last week, I didn't know about that particular bar, and maybe in 1970 it didn't exist, but there was a, a gay bar up on, in one of the little strip malls up there on um, Battleground, where Wendover and Westover and everything come together, called the Renaissance. And my straight roommate said, let's go and dance. And I went there once, and you couldn't get me out of the place. I still graduate. <laughs> I grew up in a small town, Lincolnton, North Carolina. You have to kind of, when you say Lincolnton, you have to say Hickory. And people are like, oh, Hickory. So you have to reference a small town to get to another small town. Um, I grew up in West Lincoln. Uh, we are the home of the Rebels. 
um, still in this day and age, 2017, they're still the rebels. Um, so I grew up thinking that being gay was wrong. And though my family didn't teach that, the church taught that, and so did all of the people that I hung out with. Um, I came out in 10th grade, which was really hard. Um, but as soon as I got here, I was, wor I was more worried about what my roommate thought of me than what the rest of the campus was. And um, he told me later, we're still best, like, we're best friends still, but um, he told me later that when I told him I was gay, he was like, yeah, no, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally that first week that we were here, we were up till four o'clock every, every night just talking about like what it meant to be gay because he had never had any experience with any gay person in his life. So he was just really apprehensive at first. But now we, we hang out. <laughs> Not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was pretty lily white, I'll tell you. <laughs> Slightly not quite, but um, I wouldn't say that we're, it was anywhere near as diverse as it is today. Absolutely not. I love how quickly the mic came down. <laughs> that question. Um, my perspective is that it was definitely uh, diverse. I think still, um, at least in the social groups I was running in, there were still uh, most leadership in the community was usually white individuals, usually white gay men. That's that changed though over the uh, the course of the four years I was here, though. Um, especially in my in my later years, uh, most of my most of my gay friends, most of my interactions with the gay community happened through uh, UNCG Pride and later the Queer Student Union. Um, and leadership changed, and the the demographic makeup of the club kind of changed. I don't know if that's representative of the entire community here at UNCG, but I know in the circles I was in that uh, issues of race and gender definitely got uh, forefronted a little more than they than they had been when I first arrived here, for sure. Uh, I've mentioned, I think, twice now that I joined the Pride. That was like my first thing. That was the thing I was most excited. I, I think I was more excited about joining a gay club than... Um, a gay interest group anyway than, uh, than actually like doing college stuff like going to class and stuff I was more excited about that um, and that's how I met Sarah who is here with us today who was a really big part of my freshman experience here on campus um, and it was it was amazing it was this was the first time I got to meet other gay and lesbian people and the first time I got to have other gay friends uh, that was it was amazing I got to be on the executive board eventually of that club and was able to influence like events and decision making that was happening there that was early on in my career I kind of stopped doing that as much after my sophomore year just because my academics got busier and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life but uh, my senior year I really became involved in the women's and gender studies program and I think I've met so many great uh, gay, lesbian, trans people doing really great work and really great projects in, in the Women's and Gender Studies program. And the staff and faculty there are so um, so open to gay, lesbian, trans, queer work being done on campus and willing to support that work intellectually. Um, so definitely in the later part of my academic career and where I'm at my academic career now, the Women's and Gender Studies program is, has given me so much support. And, um, that's where I've wound up meeting a lot of a lot of people doing similar work to what I'm doing as well. As far as physical spaces, I remember Pride Club meetings just to be held in Graham, like in a classroom in Graham. So we were kind of stuck on the corner of campus in the dark a lot of times. But uh, we would have events. Uh, we'd have events in the EUC. We'd have events. I think if I remember the first club meeting I ever went to was an interest group meeting that was out like close to the volleyball field. Have any of y'all been back towards that corner of campus, like where the volleyball field is and stuff? So still very much like literally on the margins of the campus sometime, but um, we did stuff that was more out in public and um, there was a big controversy about Chick-fil-A my freshman year. It was after the CEO of Chick-fil-A made those terrible comments and I remember we went to the SGA meeting and our president actually wore the pride flag 
um, or I wore it like a cape and we came into the meeting and people were upset about it, but we, we caused trouble sometimes, but that, that was okay. So the early 80s, we were just pre-AIDS epidemic, um, so we were wild and crazy. If you younger folks think you've done wild and crazy things, you didn't live pre-AIDS. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. And that was happening on this campus, I can tell you that. Um, but it was very much clandestine. Um, there were a few spots, I think, that people tended to congregate, but those were all secretive. Um, and I'm only going to tell you the one, the library uh, bathroom downstairs, right here. That's the only place I'll reveal at this point. Um, but I can tell you that life was very much in that double identity uh, place. I had a girlfriend here. Uh, she expected to marry me, bless her heart, um, but I had her here the two years that I was here as an undergraduate. Um, my roommate was very confused about that, but we never talked about my, my other identities. Now granted, on the weekends, I was over at what was then Wham, it later became Warehouse 29 and now doesn't exist anymore. Uh, or at the Palms, which was another gay bar downtown, and she always wondered where I went on the weekends. So that I was leading that double life that was so common in the early 80s, and I'm not sure that um, that we, we've, we've appreciated what that was like uh, at this day and at this day and age. Uh, we've kind of forgotten about that double lifestyle, although I know some people still live that. But campus... Uh, was not open uh, per se. I will say that we, a few of us would kind of sneak over to the EUC when the Pride group was meeting, but we never went to it because that would have really made you a target. But you could sneak around and kind of see who was around. Yeah. So that was my experience back in those days. And there was another place called General Green downtown, uh, which predates all of these, and the only reason I know about it is because Charlie Cutts, who used to own Arbor House, which no longer exists, it was a lampshade type place, uh, told me about it. So, um, you know, I, I've yet to be at a university campus where people did not plan assignations or have assignations at the university library. I mean, that's universal. I think it's, it may be, it may be international, who knows, but it would be worth a study. Um, but so, so when I got here, we tried to form a faculty club. Um, my gay friends, I didn't worry too much about, I was in a department that was very accepting. And although Marilyn Miller said that an ALA president was not going to introduce same-sex dancing at the inaugural ball under her watch, um, you know, we were pretty, pretty loosey-goosey. And um, the, I think the, um, the thing that sticks in my mind about um, um, those years is the, the the time we tried to form a faculty club, we met at St. Mary's house, we had covered dish dinners, of course, and uh, we met about three times, and my impression was that gay men were more open than um, lesbians. Uh, and I, I think that's understandable, that was true in my department, it was true everywhere, and um, uh, because there was a precedent for it. Although Barbara Giddings, among others, activists had already been to this campus in the late 70s, and so, um, I mean, it wasn't totally new stuff, it was just people forget very quickly. But my friends, I met in 12-step programs that were LGBT-oriented, and uh, I qualified, I think, for all of them. So, um, I, I was pretty, that's where my gay friends were and um, LGBT friends, and I will also say that I was married three and a half years, and it's way over way to rate it. And um, uh, I live to tell the tale. 
You have to remember that when I got to UNCG, UNCG was only about five years post WC. Um, and I was a PE major, so we were on the edge of campus. Um, and there, there were very few men, I don't know if there were very few men on campus, period, but there certainly, I think there was one guy in my PE cohort. So uh, we just didn't see y'all. I guess I didn't get to that basement bathroom. <laughs> but um, there were no organizations, um, at least none that I was aware of on campus. Um, you know, we met in dorms, we met um, in, the, in the Renaissance, which was the bar that, that I mentioned a little bit ago. But it was all very informal, um, and it was kind of like, we well, are in PE, of course you're gay. Um, so, you know, we didn't, we were pretty open, but, and so we didn't really have to do the two life thing, except when you went home, you know, my mom always wanted to know who I was dating, and um, it's like, yeah, whatever, mom. But, it, you know, it really was, I think one of the questions Stacy's going to ask us later is sort of, you know, about discrimination and safety and stuff, and this was really the place that we felt safe. And I think through most of my life, maybe that's why I came back here, most of my life I felt safer on a college campus, I think, than almost anywhere out there in the world. Maybe it says something about me, but... Well, when I came to UNCG, I learned about QSU at SOAR. Um, they, had a, they had a table, and they were tabling, as, as well as SSS and a bunch of other organizations that I, I, I talked to, because um, I was... I fell in love when I first got here at SOAR, um, so I just wanted to get involved right there. Uh, I did wait until fall, but um, when I got to campus, I, I tried to go to the Wednesday's meetings. I, I don't know what they're called, um, but when I first got here in tw uh, 2014, um, I went and I went. I tried to go to three of those meetings, but each of those meetings felt a little bit like I was not. I was not part of the friend group. I was not part of the the. Um, conversation. Now, our friend here, she would sit and talk to me. I tried three times to come, but I couldn't, I couldn't connect with the people that were there. The, um, they, we weren't the right personalities for each other. Um, so I sought other places to, to, um, to find my people. Um, I was in the living learning community for computer science that lasted three months at the beginning of my um, semester here. Uh, and three of the uh, people that were in in that living learning community with me were, were L LGBT too. So we all kind of just hung out together and we still kind of have our little group that goes around and like, uh, what class did you take last semester? Like, um, what teacher do you like? So having that group of friends when like, you try to branch out a little bit and um, now confetti, um, <coughs> learning about, like, meeting a bunch of people in a, in a space where it's not so like, I don't know, everybody just talks to, and it's so laid back, it's just, you know. Just to explain some of the abbreviations, <laughs> WC stands for Women's College. We were a women's college until 1963 when we became co-educational um, and became the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. You don't need to apologize. And QSU stands for um, Queer Student Union. And for our next question, did you witness or have you experienced any discrimination on campus you are comfortable describing in this forum? Is this related just to LGBT? Yes. So, yeah, I have not. Yeah, ditto. I mean, like I said, I've, I've always felt much safer here than out there in the world. Uh, because I was involved in committees and governance, from almost the first minute I got here, I was involved in a case that involved free library employees. And by the way, I want to back up and say that if it hadn't for organizations, if it hadn't been for Lillian Marie Adcock, uh, she ran the gay organization on this campus before we had a private office, before we had any of that. And she did an incredible job. And uh, most everything that happened during those years on campus related to students was because of Lillian. And 
uh, she was so out, you really had to have a strong stomach. And uh, she was she was good people. And uh, she still lives in Greensboro. And uh, now back back to the the real topic. Uh, two uh, female, and it may have been three, female employees of the library were name called. One got their car uh, spattered with paint and stuff. Uh, and I was serving on what served as the Human Welfare kind of Committee. Uh, this was like 1990, you remember, 1995, 96. And uh, because of that, uh, I was on that committee. Nova Mason, head of interior design, was now deceased. And Charles Tisdale, who was the chair of the faculty senate, asked me to speak up because there was a debate going around about an inclusion statement on our web page. And so I was asked to give a queen for the day statement, you know, uh, to the faculty senate because there was somebody in the philosophy department who was upset about the meaning of the word V or something. And um, so I got up and gave my little statement and it passed. But the, the incident that, that brought it up made me aware of how many incidents we would never know about as professors. Because unless students, unless you're deeply involved with the governance of the university, you really don't get to hear all of the dirt coming up. And uh, I'm very glad it did happen because because of that we became the university we are today. As Jim was talking, I, I, I don't remember the incident with the, the library folks, but I do remember the, the discussion and the, the discussion of a particular faculty member who was a, in opposition to including the inclusion statement. And um, I've always stayed away from faculty senate like the plague, but I did go that day. And that probably is the one instance where I sat there and thought, really? What, what do you care about us? We're just living our lives. Leave us alone. And I was very heartened when it passed. Um, I don't, I don't know that I, well, I didn't have an experience of being uh, discriminated against, particularly here, but I was very guarded with that also. So my hall was all guys, and um, I recognized that it was important for me to be one of the guys, thus the girlfriend. So you know, I went through that dance. But I do want to mention um, Kenneth at this point. Stacy just wrote an excellent um, remembrance of Kenneth Crump. And I knew Kenneth to some extent, not well, but I knew who he was. And I knew that he had been bullied. Um, and I remember that. Uh, and I remember the reputation of reading the article reminded me of that reputation of strong dorm and that that was really a difficult place. And the night that Kenneth died, I and a few of my friends were driving in, literally, down the road where the library tower is, and all the fire trucks were around, I remember that. We were coming back from the gay bar, by the way, and when we heard what happened, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. I, I, that really has stuck with me all these years, to think about what happened, and there was some talk, you know, in the underground world of, was this an accident? Uh, was Did something really happen differently than a suicide? Um, you know, and you know how things go like that. But there was, there was some fear around that, obviously. Um, so I, I, I do feel like the campus has, for me, always been a, a welcoming place in many ways and a kind of safe place. And certainly today, I feel that way. Um, but there, I don't think we can wash that over either. I know there have been times on this campus where there's been a lot of tension, and, and still is, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, even being here in more recent years. Uh, I personally feel very fortunate to have not faced much explicit discrimination in any kind of form. Uh, most of 
the not so explicit stuff was just passive aggressive stuff from straight roommate guys that didn't like me very much. But um, I was lucky in my later years to be able to room with other uh, with other LGBT people um, and have more peaceful living situations for the most part. Um, as far as other discrimination I've experienced, I do I do still think it's important to recognize that a lot of LGBT people do still experience discrimination on this campus, even though it is, I think, one of the more welcoming campuses I've been on and that my experience has been really well. I had a, a roommate that pretty frequently uh, experienced a lot of verbal harassment, both from like roommates, people on the street, like getting slurs yelled at them on the street, like that stuff still happens. And um, even today in, in uh, coming up to a close of my fifth year here. Transphobia is still a very big problem on this campus, both from just the campus community in general, still from faculty and staff, um, and I would say even in some spaces that are supposed to be LGBT positive, there's still a lot of problems with transphobia, people not respecting personal pronouns, um, and people not, uh, just people not willing to engage or broaden their minds about what gender can be or what forms gender can take. Um, and un like I said, there's still there's pockets of resistance on campus, and there's still really great pockets on campus where that's not the case, and those and uh, people who are transgender have the kind of respect and support they need. But unfortunately, I don't think that's as, as widespread as I'd like it to be. So, did you witness any harm in uh, I was surprised that I found other gay people because for a long time growing up in my high school I didn't think it was ever going to happen so I was just happy to have those really great positive interactions really early on in my uh, in my college career later on um, when I really got into women's and gender studies I found that there were just so many great people there and that there was really great really radical work going on in that program um, and I've, I'm so grateful that I decided to focus on that instead of political science because poli sci was great. We have a great poli sci department here, <laughs> but they didn't. Uh, it wasn't quite the same level of support that I've gotten from from women's and gender studies. Um, and my mentors there, I feel like I've learned so much in that program, and I've met so many great people. Um, it really completely changed the way that I looked at the world, um, and I think that's the most positive experience I could possibly have here at UNCG is getting my whole mind blown and world changed um, from an academic program. So, but definitely those early experiences too with the Pride Club were, were very helpful for me as well. Absolutely positive. Um, even in the early days, I, I felt like while we were underground, we still had some connections here, the, the friends that I made at UNCG. Um, later on, when I was back from my master's degree in the late 90s, the campus environment was much more open, uh, much more visible. I was certainly very visible. I wasn't hiding. There was no double life. Uh, Jay is gay, and that's the way it is at that point. So uh, that, that felt very good, and then later on, back as a faculty member and a doctoral student, uh, very, very open, very supported. Um, the research interest I have has been supported. I've got rainbows all over the place. You know, I, I have no uh, qualms about the visibility, and I think that's supported on this campus. Even in administrative circles, it's very, very supported. Um, I think the community still struggles a little bit, and I think that's probably why we don't have a GLBT center on this campus. I think we've got some community tension out there uh, that probably will continue to evolve, um, but remarkably supportive, and, and to me that just keeps growing through the years on this campus. Uh, so. My, I was thinking the first thing that came to my mind was John D'Amelio uh, and getting to know him, which is actually, was I didn't know him that well until the very end of his time here on campus, and, um, and, and it's been since he's left and gone to Chicago that I really have interacted with him and uh, shared research and all that stuff. So. I guess for me, the, the real positive interaction was that opportunity to speak to the faculty center, which was just no one laughed at me or, you know, said aha. And, uh, you know, it was fun. And I think the second way that I, I, I've been gotten affirmation 
is having an article on a, a, a national survey on attitudes uh, of male librarians towards stereotypes, uh, having that accepted as a journal, and having 10, ten minutes of fame in library journal, you know. <laughs> he found out that 86% of librarians think that there is a male, gay male stereotype. Oh my God! <laughs> and then, you know, it's like, so for 10 minutes, everybody went flap, 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 and then it was all over, but it was, you know, that really felt good, because, uh, you know, these were questions that had occurred to me every day, all of my life, and it's sort of like no one even bothered to ask. You know, and, uh, and and this was when I became aware that there is something called methodological snobbery within University of the Academy. And, you know, everything used to be quantitative. And narrative research didn't really get a hold in universities so after I got my degree and after I was here. And this thing about, you know, going and asking people, well, isn't some information better than no information? But, you know, I, I was stonewalled at Chapel Hill, so uh, this felt really, really good. I can share a couple of examples. I mean, for the most part, as I've said, I've always felt welcomed and most more people knew that I was gay way before I did than, you know. But when I came back, um, just a very quick story, when I came back, um, I went to a faculty party, maybe my first or second faculty party, and I, I went and my partner, my then partner, didn't accompany me, and I walked up to my department chair's door and, you know, knocked on the door and he came and answered and before he said hello, he said, where's your partner? Really? Am I chopped liver? <laughs> uh, you know, but that, that, I think, illustrated very nicely um, how welcoming my department was. And um, the second very quick vignette I will, will share is that when my um, spouse and I got married last summer, um, my dean came to our wedding, which was so cool. And cried. Well, I was, I was like, Zach, at the end, I was like, oh, um, there are gay people going to be at this campus. I'm going to be able to meet people. I got here and I was like, where are they? <laughs> I literally was like, where are they? And now, um, now, like, I feel from when I got here in 2014 to now 2017, it's a little bit more open than it was before. Um, we do have a pride parade coming up, which is going to be a lot of fun. But um, the... Uh, the vocalness, like words, I can't do words. Um, but I have met more people in the last two years than I met my first year here. And um, as the community still grows, because we keep adding more and more students, um, it's just a broadening community that just keeps getting bigger. So, did you have a mentor or serve as a mentor? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had so many, you know, of course, we never talked about that, uh, but I knew that several of the people who advised me, et cetera, uh, were, you know, unofficial, but, you know, it was on the QT, and, uh, or the down low. Uh, no. uh, but anyway, the, the, um, um, I certainly have the students. I've been very, very lucky. I have a student assistant now who are just absolute chases, the best. And uh, I've had several opportunities. And also Stacy. I mean, Stacy, she told me years ago that she said while we were having tea with the tea group outside, she said, um, in my next life, I want to be a gay man. And I said, oh, honey, you don't really. <laughs> You're just fine the way you are. Most gay men would rather be you. So you, just, you, just, uh, you hang in there. 
but but it's it's really been so exciting, and also the growth of the women and gender studies program. That's just been phenomenal. I'm so glad everybody has mentioned that. I'm a very lucky person. Um, early days that wasn't discussed, but my music teachers. I was in the symphonic chorus and Bill Carroll's very first year here. I was in show choir with Bill, and of course they were mentors to me here and beyond. Uh, still in friends with David Pegg, who was the symphonic chorus conductor. Still sing with David some today. Um, as far as me being a mentor, certainly I offer myself for that. I've uh, worked some on the periphery with the Pride and now Queer Student Union groups. Um, I, I feel like my activism, and, and Jim Shears says this in a lot of his writing, um, you know, there's, there's different kinds of activism, and some of it is out in the streets with signs and rainbow flags and all that, and that's awesome. Uh, my activism is mostly getting to know me. I let you get to know me, and then I spring it on you. <laughs> and then it's hard for you to hate me sometimes. So uh, I, I've done that with some folks because I am a recovering Baptist. Um, I, you know, I have been through all that, and that's still very much part of me. If you read my writings, you're going to read about that. Um, so I think that's very important for us, especially now, in this day and age, we've got to pick up all that and move forward as mentors and, and working together with younger people, et cetera. So I'm all for that. I think that's a great strategy, the, the hang and spring it on it at the last minute. I really, I really like that. Um, I've had, I feel like everybody that I've come into contact with that's been in any way related to the gay community has mentored me in some form or another because, um, again, this is my first time being around other gay people or just people that like gay people for the most part, so uh, I didn't know what to do with myself a lot of the time, so I had a lot of great people leading me along the way. Uh, Sarah is one of them for sure because she made my first year here amazing. Uh, we used to have office hours, uh, LGBT office hours in the what was then the Office of Multicultural Affairs. And every Wednesday from 4 to 6, I would be there eating all the cookies and just talking about whatever was going on in the news that week. And it was uh, a really great experience. But I was thinking about this question. I was thinking about, like, what does a mentor mean and who can be a mentor? And I think a lot of people were, were mentors to me. Now I'd say my intellectual mentors, the people mentoring me on my academic path, would be uh, professors in the Women's and Gender Studies program like Danielle Bouchard, Sarah Servanag, Michelle Powell. Um, and for people that don't know, because some people hear Women's and Gender Studies and think we study dead white women um, exclusively, which that's, that's part of it, but that's not all of it. Uh, all of our faculty in Women's and Gender Studies uh, also specialize in queer theory. So I've been able to do, uh, and other students have been able to really study their own communities, study the ins and outs of their own communities, and study the theory that their own communities are making um, about current political issues, which is which is really amazing. And I, I couldn't be doing the work I'm doing now without standing on all these people's shoulders that I've that have mentored me over the years. I think this is an interesting question <laughs> because on on one hand I want to say it's it's gotten better in a lot of ways. I there I I feel like there are just more of us now than there were when I got here even though that was 5 years ago. Uh, I think people are a lot more vocal and I think the influence of uh, groups like Black Lives Matter have really uh, put uh, the gay community's own blind spots on display in a really important way and have made us reckon with our own biases and prejudices in really important ways. Um, so there's definitely been progress on several different fronts there. I do want to say though I think there is a small group of people who are more resistant than, than ever and I've seen that um, interacting with undergraduates now. I think as there's been this kind of progress both here and on the national scene, there's now a more uh, embittered and embattled minority that's becoming more and more resistant every day. Uh, I don't think that's a lot of people. I don't think that's the overall uh, consensus attitude on the campus, but those people are there. And um, unfortunately, sometimes they're in important positions and they're in positions of power. Um, and I think that's something to stay attention to. But overall, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I've enjoyed my five years here, and I think uh, most queer people that I talk to have enjoyed their, their time here as well, and I think 
the consensus from the people I talked to is that it's getting it's it's getting continually better from year to year. Um, I've already said I think it's better overall, but you know this is a piece for me that I think a lot about now that I'm past fifty, and that is I miss the underground piece a little bit, and that, that's just my nostalgia maybe. But I kind of miss that. I miss the fact that there used to be a gay bar on that periphery of campus, you know, that's now part of the campus. Um, we don't have a dedicated gay bar in Greensboro except for chemistry. We used to have three or four of them. It was a, you know, it was kind of a, a cool lifestyle. And so I wanted to speak to that because I'm getting really interested in what that means to my generation of people and how that plays out for a younger generation who now goes over to Limelight or Green Street or whatever the clubs are now and it's just all mixed up together, you know? It's not, it's not a, a separate kind of identity and I sort of see that around campus. I see identity starting to blend and cross and intersect, and that's all great. Um, but there's a piece of that I think that warrants some some looking at, you know. Um, so I, I think that's intriguing to me. But in terms of the overall progress, we just can't deny it. I mean, you know, I used to call my friends up and say, "Oh my God, Donahue's got drag queens on. Turn on the television." That was the only time you could see a gay person. You know, now we're everywhere. I mean, you can't turn one direction without seeing some kind of queer person, right? So that's cool. That's a good thing. That's a good question. Okay. So um, I can't really separate the local from the national. So I'm going to kind of, yeah. Uh, today I got a uh, request from Bill Cohen at Harrington Park Fest to review a book about LGBTQ hospice. So that kind of tells you where you end up. Um, and um, um, it kind of changes your perspective. Uh, but I think what Zach mentioned about uh, the resistance that is now occurring in America, since I have started contemplating retirement, uh, I have been in meditation groups, I have been in yoga classes, all, other, all kinds of new activities for me, just trying to deal with this piece of the program that, that deals with how you handle someone whose point of view is totally different than you. And I think that's the biggest question facing everybody in the world today, including I was reading about the French elections coming up today. And they're going, you know, uh, queer issues are a part of every single <coughs> trouble spot in the globe right now. Which is, in a way, a good thing. It means we're screaming loudly, but we haven't learned to talk yet. Uh, but I think it's real important to pay attention to what's going on right now with the, the people who are not like you and try to figure out a way... Uh, that we can come together because we've got to sooner or later, either that or you know what's ahead. Okay. Yeah, I think the whole outness is so different from it, what it was in the '70s. Um, you know, we were out in our own little group, um, but as I said before, there were no clubs. Um, there were a few gay bars, and I, I, I'm interested to hear you guys talk about you know the sort of the death of gay bars. There was a, an article in the Times last week, I think, about, I think it was titled, Bring Back the Lesbian Bars, and it was a, a woman bemoaning the fact that there are no more lesbian bars in, in New York City. Well, hell, I've never even found a lesbian bar, I don't think. Um, but I think it is a, a really interesting time that we're in. I think because we are so much more out than we were back in the 70s and 80s and maybe to some extent even the 90s. There is so much pushback. Um, you know, we've gained so much in, in, I mean, my God, we can get married. You know, how did that happen? Um, you know, how did we get that special right? Um, 
but you know, as, as a result, there has become so much pushback, and and whether we're talking about fundamentalist, um, you know, countries with, with extremely fundamentalist religions that are now throwing people off the roofs of buildings because they're out, or um, you know, our government that is trying to find ways to take away the rights we've managed to to get. Um, it is interesting. Um, it's a real paradox, I think, right now. From the time I got to UNCG was not so long ago. Um, even though that we have more of us here, um, and we can keep growing as as the semesters keep going because our freshman class gets bigger and bigger every year. Um, I just see I you see it. You see people more. You see the, the little out buttons on everybody's thing. Ally buttons, out buttons. Um, you see the support on campus. It's not like quiet. It's like loud, screaming in your face, hey, we're here. It, it was like that when I got here, but it's a little bit louder. <laughs> what challenges in communication and understanding have you encountered within the LGBT community generationally by these groups? <laughs> My unit is Health and Human Sciences, and, and uh, our dean has a, a, a nice diversity and inclusion um, initiative that we've been working on. And three or four years ago, um, we had a, a, you know, people often think athletics is part of Health and Human Sciences, and it's not, but we live in the same building and, and so on. And we had a, a group several years ago to talk about the language we use, and there was a lot of talk about you know, it was a very wide-ranging conversation about using the N-word and who can and who can't and, and so on. And one of my younger colleagues was talking about getting married and she was talking about her wife and she said, you know, these people who use the word, word partner, that's so old school and I just don't understand. And the, as my head exploded, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, I refer to my my life partner as my spouse because to me life means being owned and being subjugated and I just had this epiphany listening to this woman about God I'm so old <laughs> Wow <laughs> We need to record that. <laughs> Shortest comment. Oh, no! <laughs> oh, that. Oh, that. Um, oh my gosh, communication. So here's an interesting thing I've been thinking about lately. You know, now it's a thing to say what pronoun you go by, right? So I'm still getting used to that in meetings that I go to. And I often say uh, he, him, and her. And I don't mean to say her necessarily, just as my, uh, you know, inept with, ineptness with English. But, you know, that's a part of the language that we had back in the early 80s, probably before. We, I always refer to my male gay friends as girl, her, Miss Thing, you know, all, this is how we talk, right? Dorothy, uh, Mary, whatever. It was a very weird gender queering of the language with gay men, especially. Um, and that seems lost now. So, like, I, I don't hear that anymore, and I'm reluctant to engage in what I grew up with as gay language. So, I, I know there's some research out there about gay language, and I'm much more interested in that now. Uh, because I don't hear it anymore like I've heard it before. In fact, probably people would get offended at me doing that kind of thing now. You know, if I were to run around and say, hey girl, how you doing? You know, so that's where my brain is with communication. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I don't think you're old fashioned at all for wanting to use the word partner because I would do the same thing if I had one. <laughs> so I don't think you're old fashioned. I don't think that's old fashioned at all. And that's interesting because I would almost expect the opposite um, in some cases because I've known that 
I've known some people that get offended that people don't want to use the word wife or husband and choose to use the gender neutral term instead. So that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think I, I also agree with you that I think terminology um, and the way that language has shifted has, has put up some barriers. Um, but I think they're productive barriers. And I think there's um, something to be said for like respecting people's pronouns, obviously. Um, and respecting people's identities and keeping up to date with how terminology and language has shifted. But I think doing a genealogy of, uh, of the lavender language is really important too, because uh, I think there's something really radical and really important to be preserved there. Um, I haven't had too many problems with this, and it's, it's interesting too with uh, thinking about how gay marriage has been le legalized recently on the national level, and it might get to stay that way maybe, seeing, seeing what's happening now. Um, that it is important to remember uh, that some people don't have an interest in getting married or don't feel like they have a stake in getting recognition for the relationship from the United States government for a lot of different reasons. Um, and that's, that's created some barriers too because on the one hand some people have been waiting for that for their entire lives and that's such a, a moment for them to finally get that legal recognition and that sometimes the, the hesitancy on behalf of others to not want that recognition and to refuse that pretty, uh, pretty strongly Sometimes those conversations um, are tense and there's tensions between the people who have been like couldn't do this and wanted to for a long time and people that never wanted to to start with. So there's some interesting both like language and I think ideological barriers as well. But I, I see those within generations too, not just like it's one generation is one way or the other way because I, I have debates like that all the time with uh, gay men and uh, lesbian women my age as well. So I think and I think there's that happens within generations and not just across it. You know, it's, it's really interesting. I've been with my spouse for 20 years, and, you know, we never talked about marriage until about three years ago because we never thought we were going to be able to. So it wasn't something that we ever addressed like, well, you know, if we can get married, should we? And, and we just never thought it would happen. And so um, we're big ice hockey fans, and... and uh, the, the day the, the soups overturned the, um, the law so that we could get married was actually opening night of the Carolina Hurricanes hockey season. So we're sitting up in our nosebleed seats and it pops up on my phone. We're sitting at the beginning of this hockey game weeping. <laughs> partly because it was the beginning of hockey season, but partly because now we can get married. But, but it was like, well, should we talk about this now? Do we want to do it? So it's been a really interesting evolution in us to make the decision about, you know, do we even want to think about it, let alone do it, to go and, yeah, that would be cool. This is our final question before we take questions from you all. Given your experiences, what can the UNCG community do better to support and improve the lives of LGBT people on this campus? So the, U the university does offer the Safe Zone trainings, um, and I have been through all three of those, the Safe Zone 1, Safe Zone 2, and Trans Zone, and I do think that education does fight like ignorance, and um, that is a big, that, that could be a, like, having faculty go to the, those kind of trainings um, and be aware of the ever-changing vocabulary that is uh, the LGBT community, um, which keeps adding. and. Um, something might change today that the community might not know about until next week and it, it's ever changing and even though like I identify in the LGBT community I don't know everything about each term under the umbrella. I need to think on it. I'll let Jim speak more now. <laughs> I don't know. So um, I, I really I think that we do have a problem with communication, period. And it's not, you know, we have an attention deficit country we live in with an attention deficit world around <coughs> us. We're all glued to our cell phones and can't say hello. And um, so I think the real problem is one that goes beyond the gay community. I think our real problem is how we're going to handle getting any message out to any group of people in a clear and concise way. 
Well, having been part of the latest, which goes back four or five years, iteration of the diversity committee, the university diversity committee, and uh, coming from a lot of focus groups and work with that was this notion of having a GLBTQ plus center on campus. We've talked about that for years. That's been floated. Um, we still don't have that. Um, and I, I, it intrigues me because there are other state universities, our sister universities in the system, that have such centers. Um, so I, I don't think that's going to solve all the problems, or maybe any problems, I don't know, but having something like that says we are supported. And when other campuses uh, that may not be recognized as, diver as as diverse as this campus have those places and we don't, I think that sends a message and I'm concerned about that, that we keep kind of pushing that and we don't get very far and I'm, that's where I think our community tension comes in, in Greensboro. Sugar daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would say that uh, I think UNCG could do to better support and improve the lives of LGBT people in this campus to stop building rec centers and start hiring more and giving tenure to more LGBT faculty um, and supporting non-LGBT faculty who are doing work in these fields. Um, I know I've plugged WJS about a billion times already, but I will say that uh, not just programs like Women's Gender Studies, but also uh, other programs on the cutting edge like African American and African Diaspora Studies are grossly underfunded by the university, unfortunately. Um, and we kind of live in a weird tension because I think um, a lot of what we want to do at WGS is take our stuff outside of the academy um, and eventually move beyond the corporate academy. And so there's, there's a lot of tension there sometimes, but uh, supporting those projects is really important. Um, because, I mean, we think about intersectionality, that's such a big word, right? That, that's such a big thing in social justice discourse now. That came out of a, the academy, that came out of an academic term, that came from a critical race scholar named Kimberly Crenshaw. So supporting the work in the academy, even though some people like to call it ivory tower theorizing and stuff, which it is sometimes, but supporting that work is what keeps the community going forward too in a lot of different ways. So. I would say that tenure for all, for all days, please. <laughs> please, because I, I want it one day, so please. <laughs> also, while we're at it, you could add to that full professorships mm -hmm. for more women, mm -hmm. because that is one of the big barriers we still have to overcome. So, do any of you have questions for our panelists? I know that some of you have lived in other locations uh, um, in your adult, um, maybe out lives. Do you have any comparative thoughts on other geographic locations you've existed in? I did my graduate work at UW Madison, so you know that was like Disney World. You could be out. 24-7, 365, that was very cool. I, my first job out of graduate school was at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, not so much outness there. I didn't have my gloves and my sundress. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it is very different in, in, in many parts of the country than it is here. Um, so I guess in that regard, you know, we, we kind of are blessed. And, and I, to be fair, maybe to be more fair than I need to be, I haven't been in Oklahoma in 30 years, so maybe it's really different. Enough <laughs> <laughs> what you need. I worked in Milledgeville, Georgia, before I came to Chapel Hill. And, you know, the theme I've heard my whole life from friends is, why don't you go to San Francisco where you can meet somebody? <laughs> and I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I've, I've lived enough places to know. Uh, Milledgeville was actually a pretty wonderful place. And I don't think it's, uh, it has anything to do with size or metropolitan flavor. Uh, 
we've had several people, including Nathan, and I, uh, I can't remember Nathan's last name now, is it Lindsay? Uh, who went up to um, New York City and, uh, you know, I think some people thrive in that, especially if you're in the performing arts or any kind of creative artist. But uh, it's not for everybody. And uh, the, the relationships I formed in a little town of 12,500 where, you know, um, it's pretty, it's like going back in the last century, were amazing. And um, so, I don't think that uh, geography is always a cure, and uh, I think a lot of times it's it's being where you are fully, and that can help a lot. I worked in Asheboro. I'm from Randolph County, North Carolina. As you can tell by my accent, um, so I am good old, you know, white bread Southern person, and Greensboro has always always in my entire life uh, even as a teenager this was the place that you came to see weird and different people um, and I think that's pretty cool that Greensboro has somehow navigated its way through uh, southernness to be this very interesting diverse place with over 120 languages spoken in our school system in Guilford County uh, with you know every every kind of person around the world practically here in some form or fashion and this community having been recognized as the most gay friendly community in North Carolina when we've got Charlotte sitting down there right, right. and well Asheville of course uh, but you know it's, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable that we're sitting right here in the middle of this place so. Asheville's been 